I thought of putting this picture from like that, Iraq. That's 1935. 1938, a group of students with their teachers. An ordinary street in the hands, 43, 63. And this is M. Chirac, who was then the Prime Minister of France, visiting the main library in Baghdad. Baghdad and Iraq is a great country, great nation. Uh, the topic for tonight is radical accession and clinical and German, clinical radiological laboratory and pathological combination. And when you never mention clinical and German, you come close to the third ventricle. So we need to know about the third ventricle. This is the view of the third ventricle, the roof, the material wall, the material wall, and the wall. It's a piece of anatomy which is difficult, and that's why people do not want to go there. This is the roof, and that picture on your left is the roof, and you can see these little veins there. And if you look at it from above, you can see both internal cerebral veins. And if you look at the floor from below, you can see the military bodies down there. Here we are, the military bodies, on the floor of the third ventricle. And if you look at the floor from above, starting from anterior to posterior, you come at the chiasm, and then you go backwards like this. This is what you see with the endoscope, and then you come to the aqueduct of cells. This here wall is basically where the pineal gland is, the suprapineal basis, and the posterior culture. The lateral wall is very difficult, because it is made of nuclei. <coughs> These nuclei are arranged in a certain fashion that if you don't know them, it's a disaster. So they are arranged from anterior to posterior in three groups, and they are arranged from medial to lateral in three groups. So here we have each of these groups with a certain function. So the anterior group, i.e., the preoptic, the supraoptic, the chiasmatic nuclei. I could serve with your sex development and with your circadian rhythm. Uh, while the middle ones are concerned with your eating habits, hunger habits, and so on. And the posterior ones are related to your mood. So your very existence is controlled by these nuclei. The anterior world is made by the laminar terminalis, which is this one. So the hypothalamus, which is four grams in weight, imagine four grams of weight of hypothalamus controlling your life, everything in your life. They control your food intake, fluid intake, metabolism, growth, sex and good production, temperature control, circulation control, i.e. blood pressure, blood sensitivity, wake up cycle, sleep wake up cycle, the anger and the attack difference and memory. So it is the very existence of your life. At this time. So as we said that we have three groups of nuclei, it is the name, the anterior group, the other group, and the posterior group. And I mentioned that the subarctic and the preoptic and suprachiasmatic system of the nuclei are concerned with the circadian rhythm and the production and so on. And the middle ones are related to your metabolism in terms of hunger, eating, thirst, etc. And the posterior ones are related to your memory and emotions. So here you are, this is 3D showing you the nuclei. The five grams of your body that controls it completely. Now we're talking about cranial meningioma. So what is cranial meningioma? It's a tumor, it's a benign tumor, but with a very ugly uh, 
So, of course, in the Gensu group, it's different from other groups. But in the Gensu Institute, 6 to 9 percent of tumors, in others, it is 3 percent. Male is slightly more than female, unfortunately for us. How often do you see a clinical in German? It's very rare. So, an average in your research might operate on one clinical in German every two to three years. In the States, about 300 million, and the more, only 120 cases of clinical in German are seen. So it is rare to see anybody in the world having this case. We have two peaks for the therapy job. Usually, children, but you always forget. We always forget that there's another peak in old age, 50 to 70. This is my youngest patient, and this is my oldest patient. How does it develop? When you are in nature, the fourth week of gestation, there is sort of process that goes from the pharynx, and the process that comes from the brain, they need to develop. If this process continues to stay, which should be disappeared at the time of birth, which is called Radke's pouch, then this is the reason why we develop the cranial function. So here we are, the two processes meeting, forming the pituitary glands, the Radke's persist, and that would cause tumor of cranial function either within the cell or above the cell. So it will be very high. So understanding this embryology is very important. So we've been speaking about three types of embryos. This is the communist in the middle, 80 to 85, which is supercellular. Five percent within the cell, five percent completely within the third branch, totally, exclusively under the third while the others are supercellular extension. This paper. Of intrachiasmatic cranial angioma, which is inside the chiasm. And if you know the embryology, you will not wonder. Can it go malignant? Yes. Cranial angioma can turn malignant. If you leave it for a long time, one of the theories of malignancy, as you all know, is chronicity. So if you have a bladder infection for a long period of time, it's in a bladder stone, you may develop carcinoma of the bladder. If you leave that tumor in, playing with it with all kinds of nonsense medications and procedures, then it can turn malignant. And this is how things evolved and how did we understand the current job. Stino from Slovenia, uh, Slovak Republic, is a close friend of mine, and we usually meet in the current job meeting, uh, put this very beautiful paper about the relationship. Of the clinical geometry to the surrounding structures. It really added to our knowledge and experience with it. So he said, listen, your tumor rising from the cellular longer could be extramuscular. So this is the problem that completely not reaching the third metric. Here it is intramuscular. Here it is both. But look at this. Here the floor is intact. Here the floor is intact, but the tumor is totally inside. Here yeah, the floor is interrupted, so the tumor is inside and outside. Uh, that's why I also mentioned with this paper about how the mammillary bodies, they are pushed by the tumor. So this is the mammillary body. With larger tumor, it was upper lateral, it was upper lateral, and goes out. So you can actually excise the clear job completely without damaging the CPI that we have mentioned. And that's because we understand the biology and the relationship. With the same paper, we measured the angle 
here the tree that everybody going access to the to to show the everybody how it is uh, displaced. So you can see how much it is displaced. As we said, the pregnancy can occur in this kind of journals. In this paper, they identified 23 cases of malignant clinical journals. Another case of malignant clinical journal from USA. So, histopathology here is different. We have two types of clinical uh, journals, and I think the two first half is here. I've seen them. Okay, we'll wait until he comes and then we'll proceed. Basically, he, there are two types, the papillary type and the adamantinoma type. This is the most difficult. Adamantinoma comes in kids and children, papillary comes in adults. The more difficult to excite is the adamantinoma because they have tentacles and they like to stick to these other structures. So I will just uh, drop on this uh, slide and get it uh, on the and then we can ask him to do this uh, about these uh, markers. And he would also mention the publications that we have done together on these publications that we published and that are recognized uh, investigators in this field. And this is one of the papers. And this has been accepted in the American Pathology Academy. So what is the treatment of these kind of angiomas? Basically, surgery is the mainstay, but there are others. There's the nucleotides, chemotherapy, synthetic radiotherapy, conventional radiotherapy, and so on. Surgery can be using different approaches. You can go through the cortex into the ventricle, you can go between the two hemispheres, you can go subconscious, you can go teriodin, transphasin, transpatrosin, or through the nose, transphenoidal microscope or transphenoidal endoscope. But what is the most feared of management of these cranial angioma? It is the amount electrolyte and water minerals. And for this, I would ask Dr. Juman, senior endocrinologist, to speak about the water and the electrolyte minerals. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, colleagues. Uh, how can you? Manual, uh, and no, no, manual. <clears throat> I will talk uh, about electrolyte disbalance in patients with craniopharyngioma. Uh, the most common presentation in children it is central diabetes sensitivity. It is pre-op presentation, either uh, short stature or visual field effects, or intermittent sometimes diabetes in, in civilians. I'm a witness of several cases of uh, diabetes in civilians, which is uh, disappeared for a little bit and nobody to take care about it. And later on, two or three years then, with uh, visual field impairment, screen for angioma was discovered. Uh, around 16 to 55% of patients, they uh, experience uh, central diabetes sensibilis before surgery. And uh, permanent diabetes sensibilis after surgery, usually up to 80% of the cases. Transit uh, diabetes sensibilis, it is around 13% of the cases. The classical response after surgery in patients uh, subjected to a craniotomy or uh, Transphenoidal approach, usually it is a craniotomy because, as Dr. Dr. Brian mentioned, it is usually with supracellar extension, you cannot excise the whole tumor via the transphenoidal approach. Uh, the usual manifestation when you cut the, uh, the stalk, usually immediately there is a DI. Often it is intraoperative. During surgery, the anesthesia and neuro, uh, neurosurgeon, they cannot serve the polyurea. Uh, the 
sometimes the polyuric phase it continue for three four days then it it can be followed by uh, three to five days of uh, hyponatremia on the opposite with the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion then uh, eventually it, the patient for in permanent uh, uh, diabetes insurance. Uh, it is frequent, this sequence, I mean a triphasic response, it is common in children. It is in this paper, it is, although it is a mini-series of around 30 uh, patients only, around 30% of the patients, they experience a triphasic response after surgery. Some of the patients, they do not experience triphasic response, just diabetes and symptoms uh, all the way. Uh, of course, uh, if uh, we are dealing with uh, diabetes insipidus after surgery, no need to do extensive workup. It is evident uh, we, you have a triple combination of uh, polyuria. If uh, we notice that there is a polyuria of more than 250 ml per hour over two consecutive hours with diluted urine, usually urine osmolarity less than uh, 100 or 300, and increased serum osmolality, usually it is above 295 millismol per kg, the diagnosis is there. You don't need, uh, in such cases, water deprivation test. You don't need to measure ADH or copeptin or aquaparine. It is a new test for measurement of ADH. Uh, I will not talk about management uh, of diabetes insipidus. It is straightforward. If the, my surgeon tell me from the beginning that the pituitary stalk was uh, damaged and it is not identified and it was uh, removed, I know that the most likely the eye will be persistent and not temporary phenomenon. But if the surgeon tell me that uh, the pituitary stalk is preserved and identified, and there is a polyuria and uh, diabetes insipidus, I realize that it could be transient due to ma manipulation. In such cases, if it is transient, I usually, if it is a multi eye, I will usually replace one cc to one cc of isotonic saline or half saline. Uh, if the patient is alert and can uh, first mechanism is intact, usually I instruct the patient to drink as ad libitum, يعني يشرب حسب العطش. Usually, if the patient uh, he is alert and first mechanism is intact, not damaged, it is enough. If there is polyuria, is less than four liter per day. But if it is more than that, it is disturbing for the patient. I add a mineral sometimes sub Q injection in very small dosages in order to avoid the big swinging from hypernatremia to hyponatremia. Usually the swinging must be per day no more than eight millimol per liter per 24 hours. To avoid either, if we are treating diabetes insipidus, we must avoid hyponatremia and we must avoid brain edema. On the contrary, uh, I will talk about, which is maybe also common in patients with uh, craniopharyngioma and other disease, it is hyponatremia. Hyponatremia, uh, it is uh, the syndrome of inappropriate AD secretion. Uh, it is uh, consists of hyponatremia, inappropriately elevated urine osmolality excessive urine sodium and decreased serum osmolality in eovolemic patients without edema. In such cases, to diagnose the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, we must exclude hypothyroidism, we must exclude adrenal insufficiency, liver cirrhosis, heart failure, in such cases, and diuretic use. <clears throat> After that, we can tell whether the patient truly have uh, the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. The Parter and Schwarz criteria for inappropriate ADH secretion, it is decreased plasma osmolality below 275 millismol per kg, and inappropriately concentrated urine more than 100 uh, millismol per kg, and the patient is eovolemic. He is not dehydrated, and he is not hypervolemic. Uh, and there is usually elevated 
sodium in spot urine, we measure sodium, it is more than 40 milli equivalent per liter. And the patient, as we mentioned, must be eothyroid, and there is no adrenal insufficiency. <coughs> uh, there is a lot of uh, conditions which can cause hyponatremia. It is hypothyroidism, hyperglycemia, adrenal insufficiency, hypopituitarism, and there are some conditions which can cause a pseudo hyponatremia, which is hyperlipidemia, hyperglycemia, hyperproteinemia. Uh, pseudo hyponatremia, as we mentioned, it is in hyperlipidemia. A gross lift, there is elevated triglycerides. Usually, uh, we can face hyponatremia, and the same applied for hyperproteinemia. And if there is a high sugar, also we uh, there is a hyponatremia. Uh, this is a formula which used to correct for hyperglycemia. Uh, you can correct uh, serum sodium with this formula. A lot of medications, they can cause uh, hyponatremia and syndrome of an appropriate ADF secretion. They are part, uh, therefore, the taking history is very important. Uh, the medication which can cause hyponatremia and syndrome of an appropriate ADF secretion, usually antidepressant, um, uh, immunosuppressive drugs, and drugs used for treatment of cancer, and also non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs, which I do not prefer to be used after surgery as an analgesic. I do not prefer to use non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. There is uh, a lot of conditions, other conditions associated with the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Uh, any central nervous system disturbances like stroke, hemorrhage, subdural hematoma can cause syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Also malignancy, particularly small cell carcinoma of the lung, Bank, uh, CA of pancreas, neck and head car uh, carcinomas, genitourinary tract carcinomas, they can cause the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Pulmonary disease like pneumonia, telectasis, bronchiectasis, they can cause, TB can <laughs> cause uh, syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. A major surgery, whether it is abdominal thoracic, via pain mechanism, it can cause hyponatremia and syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, HIV, hereditary syndrome, and idiopathic. Uh, symptoms of acute hyponatremia usually, uh, if it is acute, usually definition of acute hyponatremia must be documented within 48 hours. And yeah, suppose uh, that you are major uh, serum sodium. Two days ago, it was 140 and dropped to 130, 120 within 48 hours. This is acute hyponatremia. Uh, usually, the symptoms are uh, vomiting, it could be headache, lethargy, abdomen, and eventually seizure uh, can occur, coma, and respiratory arrest can occur if serum sodium dropped below. 115 or 110. Symptoms of chronic hyponatremia, usually there is an adaptation for chronic hyponatremia and symptoms may be absent, even with serum sodium below 120 millimol per liter. Uh, usually symptoms of hyponatremia, uh, it is vague, dizziness, fatigue, uh, memory loss, cognitive problems, uh, gait disturbances, the patients, elderly patients, they are prone for fall and they exhibit fractures. What is the test needed to confirm the diagnosis of syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion? It is serum osmolality, uh, osmolality and urine osmolarity plus said, uh, spot sodium in the urine. And uh, of course, kidney function, you have to rule out hypothyroidism, thyroid function test. You have to rule out adrenal insufficiency you have to rule out hyperglycemia and hyperlipidemia. Management, usually the cornerstone of management of hyponatremia, it is water fluid restriction. Patients after surgery taking a lot of IV fluids, a lot of IV medication. You are giving a lot of antibiotics, they are diluted with fluids, with uh, IV. Uh, you are giving, as example, dexamethasone, you are giving a lot of medication, we have to take into account the total IV fluid plus oral intake 
to calculate the total daily dose, usually we restrict fluid to 800 milliliter per, per 24 hour in order to treat uh, hyponatremia. If there is uh, acute symptoms of hyper, hyponatremia, we must give hypertonic saline 3% or what, what is available here may be available 2.7%. We usually give boluses uh, 100, 150 ml per 20 minutes, 30 minutes, then we measure uh, electrolytes frequently. The goal is not to increase serum, serum sodium from, as example, 120 to 40 within 24 hours. The allowed uh, uh, correction time for hyper, hyponatremia, it is around only 8 millimol per liter per 24 hours in order to avoid uh, in order to avoid the osmotic demyelination syndrome which is uh, rapid correction of hyponatremia can cause uh, this syndrome which uh, usually it is common in patients with alcoholism malnutrition liver disease hypokalemia uh, in this syndrome uh, usually the symptoms usually start a few days after correction of hyponatremia, not at the same time, maybe four or five days later, dysarthria, dysphagia, paraparesis, quadriparesis, confusion, coma. If there is a damage to both um, bilateral pontine demyelination, the patient presented with lactin syndrome. Of course, we have other agents now uh, for correction of hyponatremia. If it is a chronic hyponatremia, we have uh, tolvaptan. It is uh, oral agents, but in emergency cases, uh, these agents, it is, uh, they are uh, not preferred uh, because they can cause uh, first and rapid correction of hyponatremia. It is better to avoid an uh, uh, acute situation. It is good in chronic hyponatremia. Also, the same applied for D-microcycline, which is tetracycline derivative and lithium. Both of them can be used in patients with a chronic hyponatremia, but not in acute case, uh, in acute phase, because they are slow acting. The the effect usually take place within five days. Uh, this is the uh, latest guidelines from the European um, Society of uh, Endocrinology about the management of hyponatremia and in patients with syndrome of inappropriate ADH, ADH secretion. They are proposing here uh, as a, a second line, they are proposing to give small doses of loop uh, diuretic uh, like furosemide and uh, to give a high dose of salt intake uh, around 30, 40 grams per day orally. Uh, you can increase sodium, but I think it is not um, uh, 40 gram uh, orally uh, salt intake it is not uh, not adequate I think the best approach in acute uh, hyponatremia is hypertonic saline. thank you very much uh, thank you Muhammad uh, I knew Muhammad now for the last 30 years and I'm proud to say that we have not lost a patient for DI or for the athletics. It is a teamwork, and the difficulty of surgery is matched only by the management of water electrolyte animals. The Dr. Farsak is here, so we'll go back to the presentation. Uh, I'm going to present our experience about uh, cranial frangioma. All the pictures that I'm showing is actually from our own cases, me and Dr. Brian Spear. I'm not getting any pictures outside our own cases uh, because this is our own experience in uh, lecture. Uh, cranial frangioma is divided into papillary and adrenal uh, types. The papillary actually is very rare. Uh, this is uh, one case out of 33 cases that we have together. You can see it's a cystic case. The second cyst, usually there is no brain invasion. And beta catenin individual is membranous, not cytoplasmic, it's not uh, Not cytoplasmic uh, or uh, nuclear. 
Okay. Uh, the adamantomatis at the, uh, is the most common, and uh, usually they occur in children and adults. We have two weeks of craniofrangioma, one week in young children, and the other week after 50s. Uh, usually, as you can see, you know, they are cores of islands of squamous cells. Typically, uh, they mimic uh, very much amyloblastoma in the jaw because they have the same origin. They have, they have palisadic cells and uh, stellate reticulum cells and uh, with keratin and superficial cells. Yeah. There are four layers of squamous cells. It's very important uh, to emphasize that there are four layers because we did a project on this one. See, for example, I will show you here the four layers. Again, the, the palisading, the stellate reticulum, the wet keratin here, and the superficial cells. Each one of these, it seems they uh, stain differently with different types of uh, cytokeratins and indicate that evolution of different types of uh, uh, craniopharyngioma. You can see here, for example, here it's always, always in adventurous craniopharyngioma, there's brain invasion. So this is not a sign of malignancy. It's, this is considered benign. This is the brain and this is the squamous cells. These are the superficial squamous cells and they are the basal cells. Basal cells usually, uh, they have a palisading pattern. And this is the wet keratin pattern. There are many times you see uh, histocytes, warm histocytes, and this is cholesterolically because of the uh, contents of the uh, craniofrangioma from the keratin dis uh, disposition. And this is always their brain page, as you can see, with the uh, 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 changes and xanthomatous uh, uh, changes. Uh, and adamantous craniofrangioma, the beta ketanin, uh, this is the case that probably both of them they are different tumors. Beta ketanin is positive in nuclear and cytoplasmic. You can see strong. This is different cases that we have. Oh, uh, you can see the nuclear staining here, nuclear and cytoplasmic, strong staining, different from the papillary meningioma, which is usually just membranous. So I believe actually uh, papillary and adamantous uh, meningioma are two different diseases, uh, two different entities. Craniofrangioma. Uh, in our study, we did study uh, on these cases. Actually, this is uh, the only study that's present in the literature differentiating the four layers of craniofrangioma. Uh, we did different types of cytokeratin. You know, cytokeratin is the one that stains intermediate elements of cytokeratin, and they are present only in epithelial cells. And, but there are so many different cytokeratins, more than 20 types of cytokeratins. We applied this on uh, craniofrangioma, and we found that uh, these are the cytokeratins that Markers 7, 20, 19, 5, 6, high molecular weight cytokeratin, low molecular weight. The epithelial membrane antigen is not cytokeratin, but one that, is, that stains usually the epithelial cells. And this is 63 also is not cytokeratin, but also stains uh, uh, epithelial cells. We did on, uh, uh, this study and we published it. We can see the different types of uh, uh, staining on different types of uh, uh, layers of. This is high molecular weight cytokeratin, and you can see it stains uh, uh, the stellate reticulum and the basal cell layer. Uh, this is the, the low molecular weight cytokeratin. It stains strongly the basal cell layer, while much less the stellate reticulum cells. Cytokeratin 19, we have a, a story with it. It stains mostly the basal cell layer and the uh, superficial layer, and this the stellate reticulum. Uh, we noticed that cytokeratin 19 stains all, almost all of the uh, cysts on the brain, and we published uh, a, a study on this one. Uh, cytokeratin 7 stains uh, the stellate reticulum mainly. You can see this is the stellate reticulum layer, but it's negative from the basal cell layer. And cytokeratin 5, 6 stains mostly the superficial cell layers. Uh, and epithelial membrane antigen in the market stains mostly the stellate reticulum and the superficial uh, cell layer, and you can see here. And B63 stains mainly the basal cell layer, uh, and you can see in different areas, and it's nuclear staining, not cytoplasmic. Uh, so uh, each one of these layers, it, it, they are distinct, and they have different cytokeratin staining. Uh, this is very important because sometimes uh, it, it enters the differential of uh, craniofarangioma in small specimens, 
enter the differential of graphic clip cyst or uh, epidermoid cyst. And you, by, by doing this, uh, and we, we actually added this in the literature, you can really rely on small biopsies with other cases. If it stands, for example, for cytokeratin 5, 6 in the uh, stellate cells, this is unlikely to be epidermoid cyst. This is B53 uh, expression. Uh, actually, this is very, very variable. Sometimes it's, it's almost 50% of the cells, and sometimes only one cell, and sometimes there's no staining. But we don't, we, we do not think you know, this is really related to any aggressiveness of the tumor. And the same thing also, Ki67. Uh, it ranges. I was studying from uh, uh, 20% to almost uh, zero to one percent, and this also does not correlate with the uh, prognosis. Uh, CD68 is part of the histocytes. You see a lot of uh, CD histocytes infiltration in the tumors. And this stains the cystocytes. As I said, GFAB stains the brain tissue, and it's very typical to see craniofrangioma in infiltrating brain tissue. The brown staining here is the brain tissue. You can see how extensive. In other tumors, like in meningioma, consider this is part of the malignancy. But in craniofrangioma, this is normal to see invasion of the glial tissue. Uh, sometimes they infiltrate the pituitary, as, as in this case. And we did sign up to it, it stains the cells, and this does not indicate that it is a malignant cell. Uh, we did actually many publications, me and Dr. Ibrahim, on the, the cases that we have, we do together, because we are not just only in private, although we are in private, we are, we are very much interested in uh, uh, producing more and more papers on the literature. And uh, we did about uh, nine cases, these are the cases. This is one of the cases that we did. Um, on the craniofrangioma and was accepted. This was presented in the CAP in Las Vegas in 2016. And you can see differential expression of human histocrystal markers for epithelial squamous cells in adenomatous craniofrangioma. And I'll show you a short uh, more detailed case. And this is another, this is the paper that we uh, published in this International Clinical Pathology Journal. Uh, and uh, this is a uh, the cytokeratin 19 that actually we presented uh, in the Nashville. Uh, Tennessee uh, CAP uh, to American pathologist uh, meeting, and it was accepted. We, we pointed out, and actually, this is the first time I saw it in the literature that we pointed out that cytokeratin 19 stains all cyst cystic lesions in the brain, regardless. And probably this is because of cytokeratin 19 present in the very early cells on the brain tissue. And with it, but with it, and most of the uh, cysts in the brain tissue actually they originate from embryogenic origin, although they may present later in life. And that's why probably cytokeratin 19 present in all these cases. Thank you. I just want to allude to the young generation in this room about publications. Myself and Hassan are all people, but here to are working on publications every month. How many publications have you done, young people? If you don't do it now, you'll never do it. Back to the treatment, as you said, surgery is the mainstay of, uh, of management. And we listened to Dr. Muhammad Juma alluding to the, the management of the electrolyte uh, balance and balance and uh, fluid. Uh, here is another person who plays a great role in the management of these uh, people. So I'm calling upon Dr. Farasa Baeshe to present what are the difficulties of anesthetizing a patient with craniofrangioma. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Firas. I'm a anesthesiologist at uh, Farah General. Uh, I'll be talking briefly about the anesthetic challenges that we face uh, during the uh, anesthetizing patients uh, with the cranial pharyngioma. Um, the anesthetist plays uh, a vital and uh, very important role, uh, especially in the, uh, uh, that the patients with the cranial pharyngioma require a multidisciplinary teamwork, including the endocrinologist, neurosurgeon, uh, oncologists and the anesthesiologists as well, and the intensivists can be post-operative care. So uh, in the pre-operative period, uh, the anesthesiologists should pay, should pay attention to several issues. Most importantly, the tumor size, 
proximity of uh, the tumor to the critical structures. So uh, this is very important to, uh, to know what to expect during surgery. And the effect uh, of this tumor on the intracranial pressure and the endocrine abnormalities as uh, most importantly diabetes insipidus and syndrome of inappropriate ADR secretion and in some case reports there are uh, case reports uh, in patients with cranial uh, pharyngioma with cerebral salt wasting syndrome uh, this should be done closely with consultation with the uh, endocrinologist and the effect of radiotherapy if already given preoperatively uh, as many patients uh, receive radiotherapy and this would affect uh, so many tissues uh, and surgery would be much more difficult if the patient has received radiotherapy. In terms of anesthetic uh, considerations, uh, no, uh, as uh, Dr. Ibrahim has uh, alluded uh, previously that most of these uh, tumors occur in, in the pediatric population. So we should not deal with the pediatric population uh, just simply as small adults because there are so many differences in terms of anatomy and physiology, especially when it comes to neurophysiology, uh, as the blood-brain barrier is not as uh, <coughs> mature as the uh, adult population. So neurosurgery in the pediatric population is very challenging, uh, especially as we said to the neurophysiological variation that exists between the adults and the, the pediatric population. Uh, one major issue that we uh, challenge that we face uh, during uh, uh, cases with cranial pharyngioma is the vascular access. Uh, because whenever you anesthetize a patient uh, with cranial pharyngioma, you have actually to secure at least two peripheral intravenous lines, and we should always, always consider a central line in case we need uh, inotropes intraoperatively and postoperatively and in case uh, we need uh, in case we face diabetes insipidus uh, intraoperatively which is rare as compared to the postoperative period uh, then we might need either desmopressin or vasopressin infusion it's very important to stress the monitoring during these cases uh, it's mandatory to have a direct uh, blood pressure measurement using an arterial line. Uh, this is to closely monitor blood gases, especially uh, uh, partial pressure of, uh, of uh, carbon dioxide. This is to control uh, the intracranial pressure. Uh, serum electrolytes should be monitored closely uh, instead of sampling the patient uh, and puncturing the patient every time. So an arterial line would be uh, life-saving in these situations. Uh, for frequent sampling and to actually calculate those malality, which I will be talking very briefly later on, and the hemoglobin uh, levels intraoperatively, as these cases uh, might be faced with uh, massive bleeding intraoperatively. What are the intraoperative uh, considerations and risks uh, uh, during uh, cranial pharyngioma cases? Adrenal insufficiency, uh, which might be actually uh, diagnosed preoperatively. Perioperative steroid replacement, and this uh, should be discussed uh, thoroughly and uh, very closely with the endocrinologist. Significant blood loss, uh, as I said, especially when the tumor is very close uh, to the vascular, uh, the major vessels in the brain. Uh, diabetes insipidus, which is most commonly encountered postoperatively, as I mentioned, but actually in some cases we might actually uh, encounter it for the first time intraoperatively. Hypothalamic disturbance, uh, and as uh, Dr. Ibrahim has stressed out that the hypothalamus controls everything in your life. Uh, so if any hypothalamic disturbance, this, this would mean uh, that intraoperatively we would, uh, we would face uh, uh, thermo, uh, thermo dysregulation. So temperature uh, dysregulation intraoperatively. So temperature control is of utmost important. And this is one of the cases that you have to be in close contact with the surgeon to inform uh, the surgeon intraoperatively that uh, we have wide variations in temperature. As the segment changes, this is especially when the surgeon is working very close to the anteromedial nucleus of the hypothalamus. This is extremely important because this might mimic uh, ischemic changes, uh, so it might be mistaken for an MI intraoperatively. So uh, if the surgeon is working very closely, especially to the anteromedial nucleus, it should be differentiated from uh, any cardiac event. 
and then seizures and uh, a brain stem injury because this would reflect on the patient postoperatively in case they are, remain in a comatose uh, state. And then uh, avoid bucking and uh, coughing in, on observation uh, of the trachea. This is on recovery of the patient postoperatively. And thank you very much. As you can see, this is a monthly system, monthly modality management of the patient. It is not one person show, it is group uh, people, uh, group of minds looking together for the benefit of the patient. Uh, I hope you are ready now for the bullet train because I'm going to go very fast. Surgery is the mainstay of the management of these tumors. Basically, people uh, are two types other people who go for radical accession or people who would go for biopsy, so-called partial excision. This is a criminology for me. This is a crime to take a biopsy and send the patient for radiotherapy. I say it loud, I've said it for 30 years. It is not on. Still, it is practiced in this part of the world. I will give you the evidence that this is not good. Difference between radical excision where there's no recurrence, less recurrence, and no one procedure, no radiotherapy, and so on. I collected for you the major surgical series, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. 1977, uh, Harold Hoffman, who is considered to be the father of pediatric surgery, is from Toronto, and he actually is a mentor of so many pediatric neurosurgeons. He was talking about radical excision of cranial injury, 1977. Uh, again, Hoffman, together with uh, people in uh, Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, 1992, aggressive surgical management of cranial injury. Look at this back in 1990. It is mentioned in a textbook called Humans. We advocate radical resection as the optional treatment in all patients, especially in young children. And they added incomplete resection is a virtual guarantee of recurrence of injuries. So no argument about it. Still you find mediocre surgeons standing and talking about biopsy and radiotherapy. Uh, this is the giant of giants. Hamad Razi Yazajir from Turkey, who lived in Switzerland. United States and now back to Turkey. Uh, his paper in 1990 approaches long term results in 144 patients with total removal. 1990, uh, Falbusch, Rodolf Falbusch, who works at any in Hanover, Germany, surgical treatment of clinical injuries, experienced with 168 patients. Complete resection with acceptable morbidity can be obtained in 80 to 90%. These are the giants of the surgery. Again, Rodolf Farbusch, 2012, 2012. Uh, he's now, he, he was at Erlangen, Germany, 73 patients, radical accession. Conclusion of his paper, open surgery with intended total resection remains the treatment of choice in most patients. Majid Sami, giant of giants of neurosurgery, advocate aggressive removal even for recurrent or giant uh, tumors. Here we are together with uh, Farbush and myself. Uh, this is radical surgery in neonates, and this is coming from Germany. Clinical endomas in adults and children, study 122 surgical cases from Paris. Conclusion. These are real papers. Radical surgery gives better outcome of survival, full recovery, and better quality of life for both adults and children. Is there any place for any mediocre surgeon to stand and speak about biopsy and radiotherapy? I hope they would be uh, disappearing from the world totally. Another paper, surgical management of recurrence, not only the primary cases, the recurrent cases, from Japan. Conclusion, recurrence of cranial meningioma can be safely managed by using contemporary microsurgical techniques. The role of surgery and adjuvant radiotherapy if you cannot remove it 
in the very future, but this is the mainstay of treatment. Notice here, first surgery, second surgery, third surgery. So even if you have recurrence, you treat it with surgery. But if you are a mediocre surgeon and you have never done a case in your life because you are sitting in a bunker uh, doing nothing, then you would advise the absolute therapy. Paper from USA, clinical enjoyment in children, surgical experience at Children Memorial Hospital, total resection provided in the post in the best outcome. Paper from Turkey, this part of the world, clinical enjoyment children. Conclusion, treatment should be individualized. The goal of surgery should be gross total removal. Uh, this paper, again, from Tomita, from uh, Japan, about 54 cases, total resection, provided the best outcome. From Argentina, radical resection of the for enjoyment by Zucaro. These people we meet in craniofaryngioma meeting. I attend and I travel with my daughter here to Canada test. I travel 20 times to 30 times per year to these conferences. So I know what I'm talking about. And I don't want to be a certain or a resident standing in the meeting and say that this is biopsy and radiotherapy. Osama al Mifti, another giant of surgery, is from Syrian origin in the United States. Uh, petrosal approach for total removal of giant tumors. Look at this paper. Efficacy and safety of radical resection of a primary or recurrent clinical injuries from Wissow in the States. And from France, from Christian saint jean and saint Rose, who is again a giant of pediatric surgery. France is full of uh, giant pediatric surgeons. Christian saint jean and Louis Schultz and many others, Jiroko and so on. So again, he's uh, advocating radical excision. And what does he say? The best overall result is achieved by complete resection, by experienced craniofaryngioma surgeon, not a mediocre surgeon who does not know what to do. If you cannot do radical excision, then you do some total resection for a So an experienced surgeon who could not do it, then you can give me the Majid Sami again for the giant uh, tumors, for the current tumors. 56 cases, 21 more giants, radical excision. From China, radical resection. Again from China, radical resection, total resection. Uh, this is from Edward Blows. If you don't know Ed Blows, he is the giant of pituitary cellular tumors. Giant of giants of pituitary, together with others, but he's the most prominent. He was the chairman of the Neurosurgical Society, and he's the chairman of the American Surgeon, College of Surgeons. Here we are in a meeting in uh, California for the Pituitary Society, which I am a member. What does he say? Unfortunately, non surgical options have provided limited benefits, so don't go for other than surgery. Because they are, they are doing some risk. Non-surgical options should be reserved as adjuvant treatment, following surgical management, following surgical management. And the best long-term outcomes have been reported following a gross total resection. Do you need more evidence? Here you are. From Korea, 2015, complete resection. Yes, yes, yes. The answer. Is complete resection possible? Yes, yes, yes. Again, another recent one, 2018, radical excision of the German German from Japan, 81 patients, radical excision. Again, radical excision from Fing, 2018. And this is from Mayor Bennett. I think you believe Mayor Bennett in Russia still. Maximum safe resection via microsurgery, whether microsurgery or endoscopy, provides very good tumor control. So do you need more? They have covered the whole world and covered the whole complications. Pediatric, especially for pediatric, it is the primer for the skull based surgery, but it is for skull based surgery, for experienced surgery, not for pediatrics. Who knows nothing about neurosurgery except to put screws in the back of patients and put the shot. Endoscopy is another form of surgery which has gained popularity. And look at this use that you see with endoscopy. I maintain and I always say that endoscopy 
and in industry lies the future of Venezuela. It is evolving, it is very beautiful. Look at this piece of an atom. Optic nerve there, optic nerve on the other side, the KR. You can see the stroke coming from the head is going to shoot it in there. You can see the detail. Beautiful view. Papers. The Vitis 2007, the Vitis from Italy with Paolo Cavabianca from Napoli. Look at the views that they produced with their endoscope. But they are going for radical excision, they're not going for biopsy. So, whether you're doing it through craniotomy or doing it through the microscope or using it with the endoscope, the aim is radical excision of the tumor. So, look at these views. From uh, Kassam, 2008, with this group, or Gardner and the others, they also produced this beautiful paper about the classification of craniopharyngioma by endoscope. Accession from Italy, again, the same group, especially from Giorgio Frank, my friend from Italy, is uh, one of the best endoscopists. Uh, Fred Gentili from, uh, from Toronto, Canada, presenting this paper with his uh, Associate Dashati. And look at this, they are going for radical accession. So it needs a dedicated team, it's not one person. Your surgeon, neurologist, endocrinologist, ophthalmologist, and your radiologist, your pathologist, radiation oncologist, it is one team. So, in Arabic, So, if you have experience, you have an impact on the extent of the surgery. If you do radical excision, this speaks highly about you. If you don't, this speaks low about you. So, it is your state of mind when you want to start the operation. Are you going for radical excision or you have started already thinking, I'm going to go for biopsy? And you speak to your residents, convincing them that I am a wise surgeon and I'll stop because I don't want to do this patient. You want to stop because you don't know how to operate. So, am I going for biopsy or am I going for radical excision? I'm going for radical excision. Maybe I can't. But this, I have tried. I think the patient the best chance possible. What are the bad practices that I have seen? Insertion of Omaya Reserva. For goodness sake, this practice is still on in Jordan and Asia and in Arab countries. And this is a crime against humanity. Who is Omaya? It's Ayub Khan Omaya from Pakistan, who was born in Pakistan, but he migrated to England. He studied in uh, Oxford, in Cambridge, and then he Emigrated to the United States. There, they started his work in a research fashion. Uh, they were giving intrathecal antibiotics for people with meningitis, or giving intrathecal chemotherapy for cases of cancer. So they used to do lumbar puncture every day. Imagine a little boy, we do lumbar puncture every day. So I said, Oh, let me think of something. Let's put a reservoir here, connect to the ventricle. And each time you just puncture the event, the reservoir. It was a great idea for a great inventor. Omai is a great inventor. He thought of highly because of this invention. But he, he produced this invention for another kettle fish completely. Mediocre surgeon jumped on the idea. This is the treatment for cranial injury. It is a crime. It is very much behind for any, any surgeon practicing is a low class surgeon. Look at this. Omega is a being put. You inject a dye, you inject so and so. It is nonsense, total nonsense. It is not the purpose where Omega is was invented. And this is paper about seedling, because you do the drop up, the puncturing, so you may seed the uh, tumor cells. What does my clinic say about this? Omega reservoir is only palliative and should only be used for terminal cases, terminal dying people. It is not a primary treatment. It should never be considered as a first line treatment. In Jordan, in the Arab countries, in Asian countries, it is the primary treatment because the surgeon is a mediocre. Another pra bad practice? Oh yes, too many. Shunt. They shunt anything. Look at this. Tumor, they have put a shunt. Why? Because he cannot take up the tumor. So what should he do? He put the shunt. 
If this was my boy or your boy or girl, you would not accept this. Why do we accept it for others? Look at this. Look at this chant, even if it is put in the wrong way, because even we don't, they don't teach them the proper chant. This is a value. You should fail in the exam. You should be kicked out from the residential program. Worse, bilateral deviations. Bilateral. Not one side side, bilateral. Look at this. Tumor is the same, and you have two chunks inside. So I produced this paper, published it in the surgical neurology, and I called it, Do We Need a Neurosurgical Interpol? We have crimes, we have criminals, and we should point them out because they are doing damage to our people. So I call it, call the Interpol if you see such a neurosurgeon. Do we need a neurosurgical interpol? Yes. We should consider the creation of a neurosurgical interpol to exchange information about the criminal neurosurgeons. God knows I'm doing my job. This is going to be a war because these people, they will release the government because they are the neurosurgeon, they will fight you back. So I call it the neurosurgical therapy. <laughs> what about radiotherapy? So many forms of radiotherapy, but the mainstay is surgery. And then if you cannot do surgery, then you can go for radiation, whether it is external beam, whether it is conformal beam, it is intensity modulation, proton beam radiotherapy, cytotactic, and brachytherapy. But remember, most of these people are children. If you give them radiation, you will damage their brains, cognitive functions, etc., etc. And this is one child who had received radiotherapy after biopsy. Look at his brain being necrotized completely. So people produce papers comparing different types of treatment. Uh, this is from USA comparing conformal proton radiotherapy with others. And they say there's no difference. Another paper also comparing different types of uh, radiotherapy, but they say proton beam is the, the best. And they compared IMRT, PT, and the conformal radiation, and they found that the dose fall off is better in the proton beam. I say that because I am a radiosurgeon and I know these uh, physiological facts. Again, here, comparing different types of stereotactic radiotherapy with the, the conformal radiotherapy, the dose fall off is less. The green is the dose fall off, fixed in the brainstem. Here, the green dose fall off is little. From Harvard, combination of different types of radiation, but again, that is if surgery has failed to do radical excision. Radiosurgery, another crime. Pushing the button and just getting thousands of dollars and doing nothing for the patient. So there are limitations, and this tumor is inside, attached to the optic apparatus, so you should not even think of using it. <coughs> Having said that, I am a radio surgeon, I have brought the gamma knife back in 1996, but I always say a fool with a tool is still a fool. And these are papers about the uh, look at this, you cannot, you shouldn't. <coughs> Give this attached to the optic apparatus and look at the result after one year. It's just the same. And this week about tumor control. What a nonsense. Gamma knife treatment. Look at this. What a result after 30 months of and so on and so forth. So, what about intracystic radionucleotide? I remember in my days. Uh, we were talking about lithium 90 and then things evolved, the mass in 32 and uh, interferon and so on. Some papers using bleomycin. Bleomycin is antibiotic that was found to have uh, anti metabolite effect. So look at this. Bad result. I mean, it is not good result, so we should not even publish this paper. From Brazil using interferon, and again, they say, oh, look at the tumor. The tumor is still there after two years. Phosphorus 32, how many times? Once, twice, thrice, or four times you can check this, and if it leaks outside, the patient will die. Let me give you the conclusion of this. What is the use of intracystic bleomycin? This is by Liu. Searching multiple databases. Please mark my words. Multiple databases. M mark my words. Articles, reviews, conference proceedings. Ongoing trial database, we are unable to promote the treatment with intracystic bleomycin 
in children, period. They buy. And you should not give this to anybody going for surgery. It does not cause adhesions. So what are the complications that we see due to the treatment? Can affect any structures in the area of the of the uh, tumor, especially the pituitary. Look at this. Before, before anything, before any treatment, by surgery or others, 25% they have some hormonal disturbance. And post treatment, a good number of them will need thyroid, they will need growth, and they will need uh, treatment for the eye. Don't be fooled. You have to treat them. Once they reach you with hormonal imbalance, they are not going to recover. Hypothalamus, obesity, they eat much, so they gain weight. They don't sleep well. Temperature either rising, rising up or down, and psychological. Obesity, in particular, before treatment is 35, and after treatment 55. Vigil, before treatment 50, 80, 30, 60, after treatment. And they can develop hypothalamus in 50 to 60 percent of cases. But what about the prognosis and all How do we look at clinical job? Is it good or bad? It's good. It needs people who can actually operate on this. Look at this from Finland. Five year overall survival, 73 percent. And this is an old paper, 70 to 82. From USA National Database, recent paper, 80 percent. Over all five years of life. From German registry, 98%. In Jordan, in Arab countries, in Asian countries, if you have a clinical angioma, you will die. You are sentenced to die. They put Omega Reservoir and they just keep injecting, 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 or put shunt, the revision of shunt, until the patient dies. Let me tell you about my personal series. We mentioned before. That you get a clinical injury every two to three years, that if you are lucky and all the cases are 50. I was lucky, extremely lucky. People don't want to operate on clinical injuries. They throw them at the knee, and I am happy to take them. 102 cases, one of the largest series in the world. That's why I'm a constant uh, visitor of the clinical injury conferences. Children more than adults, but look at this giant ones. 74 out of 102 giant ones. Do you believe me? It's up to you. Mostly they are mixed and there they are. Every single case of them, you would say, oh, did you actually start to collect cases since 85? No, I started collecting cases since 80, since I was a first year president. I learned the power of documentation. So every case is documented. Look at the giant sizes. I'm just going through like a bullet train. These are real cases. These are my cases. For all cases, we do physical examination. We do images, do visual assessment. We do endocrine assessment and psychological assessment. People forget about psychological assessment in brain surgery. We are constant users of psychological assessment before any brain surgery, including clinical injury. And the brain will do the whole host of investigations. And of course, as Dr. Muhammad Juma said, here and the serum was malality. You do the brain CT scan, you can see calcification. Calcification can appear in about 70% of cases of clinical injuries. We do MRI, 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 like this one. And we do the psychological analysis. Uh, usually, Dr. Walid Sarhan does that for us. He has two psychologists. They come and assist the patient before surgery and after surgery. Not only for clinical neurons, but for all brain tumors. This is the uh, ophthalmology investigations that we do, including everything from endoscopy, optic OCT, etc., etc. Uh, front of this German chart where they combine visual acuity individual field to give you a score. You can also do the potential responses for the optic nerves. And you do before surgery and after surgery. So in June 2, this patient had almost blind. But 
look at how the visual fields work. So not only before surgery, but also after surgery. I love to use the laminar turbulence approach, but I'm not only a master of this approach, and I'm considered as a master of this approach in the world, but I use other approaches accordingly. So I have tried all the approaches that I've mentioned, telurinal, subfrontal, bilateral subfrontal, transvasal, but I love this approach. And there are many people like me who love this approach. Speaking from Japan, speaking about this approach, internationally, you go between the two hemispheres. Another paper from Japan, again from Japan, about the transbasal approach. And uh, this is one of the paper by Michael Mitchell Gerber. Mitchell is a man of, uh, of the glioma, but he does uh, a lot of uh, other tubes. And uh, this is my course, uh, work course uh, session. It's my corona. I put it behind the hairline so that when the hair comes, you will never discover that he had surgery. And this is the laminar terminalis where I go. This is a paper by my friends from Italy. And these are the views of the laminar terminalis. This is if you go to the woman, you would come sideways. I don't like this. I've tried it, but there's always a missing angle. Here you are seeing everything. This is the tube, this is the chiasm, this is the prefix, and here we go through the terminalis. Look at this tumor presenting through the laminar terminalis. So if we look here, this is the right optic nerve, left optic nerve, optic chiasm, right optic tract, left optic tract, and the tumor is presenting through the laminar terminalis. And look at the view here after the section, you can see. The basal in the depth of the mud. And uh, a piece of anatomy here about the Lilliquist membrane. Lilliquist is a, uh, a surgeon from Sweden, and he discovered this membrane is made of two leaflets, the upper leaflet and the lower leaflet. You have to know it by heart how to find the Lilliquist. Some of my cases, uh, I call this Hiroshima and Nagasaki of uh, jobs. It looks like Hiroshima too. You go for biopsy here? No, you go for medical extension. Another patient with this larger tumor is follow up with radical excision. No radiotherapy, no chemotherapy. Another patient from Syria with this extensive complex. Look at this. We are on the lateral ventricle and going down to the foramen magnum. And he presented with hydrocephalus. Do we put a shunt? No because we are not criminals. So we excite the tumor completely, and there he is. And the patient from Yemen, this giant tumor before and after surgery, had a mentinoma, a difficult one. Patient from Iraq, back in 1998, Kurdistan, and there he is. And the patient from Libya, this extensive recurrent kind of tumor. Again, from the moral, to a foreign magnet. Optic nerve, as optic nerve, sharp, look at the carpet, you can see the tips. Similar cases before and after surgery. Patient from uh, Kingdom Saudi Arabia, what did they do? Shot. Because this is what they can do. Okay, don't put a shot and send them to somebody who can do the surgeon, huh? Because they want the money. They want to train people to do shows. And when they train them, they train them, they train them wrong. So we did a radical excision for this patient and for the patient for so many years. Patient from Libya with this tumor, husband is a GP, and she was pregnant 36 weeks. So brought her to the cesarean section, excised the tumor completely. Patient again from Yemen with this tumor, before and after. For the last this lady. And this lady came in from, uh, I think from Bahrain. Uh, somebody tried to go through transnasally, which is not a good approach to start with, ended up with causing aneurysm of the carotid. So she was referred to us for gamma treatment. Of course, we didn't uh, neutralize the aneurysm, and then we went in 
to the next slide there too. I'm sent have a comment. Let's look at some of these videos. Maybe you'll believe me after all. No, not necessarily. Not necessarily, not necessarily at all. The percentage of clinical is going malignant is very, very little. Only 23 cases reported in literature. So this is one case. Again, here, you have to appreciate, this is the chaos. Behind the chaos here is the laminar terminalis. And if you open it, you will get fluid, the usual engine oil fluid. That's what people do. They just open the cyst, drain some fluid, hooray, hooray. We have done decompression of the chaos. Nonsense, crime, because this fluid is gonna develop within two weeks. So you want to go look at this after the drainage of the fluid, look at the amount of the tumor we are removing. This is the bread and butter. This is going to give you the cyst. And if you're going to treat it with radiotherapy, it's not going to work. If you want to put Omega reservoir, it's not going to work. It ends with death of the patient. So you can find the plane of equilibrium. It is nonsense that they talk about there is no uh, plane of equilibrium. There is always a plane of equilibrium, but you just have to look for it. Have to people persevere. Let's go for the second one just to show you a taste of these cases. Maybe you would believe me. Another case where also here it's a pre prostate scan, but the tumor is totally in the third ventricle. So this is the stroke. If the stroke is healthy, I don't touch it. If it is tumorous, I take it immediately. There's no point in leaving a tumor in the stroke. And if you have a good endocrinologist like I have, then you know you can manage the patient's well. But if you leave a stroke with a tumor in, you're asking for trouble. So there you are. So tumor after tumor, it's a school of thought. It's not one case. So here, we're splitting it from the right optic tract. Okay. This is a recurrent one. Recurrent clinical enjoyment. Treatment? Hmm. Surgery. Not radiotherapy. Surgery. It's difficult to disconnect these adhesions, but this is the price you pay to get good results. Here we are dissecting the arachnoid membrane at the carotid system. So lots of, I will just move fast, a lot of adhesions. You just open it. Recurrent. No, this was recurrent. This was removed completely and it came back. They are more adverse. Look at this here again. You can see the optic nerve and the chiasm. So you start removing it. Again, fluid coming out. Hooray, hooray. Decompress the optic apparatus. No, you have done nothing. You have done a crime. You have to remove the tumor completely. Have you done the second recurrence? Yes, I've done the third recurrence. So here is the stroke. Stroke is completely tumorous. There's no point in leaving it. It will cause recurrence. It will cause the tumor to stay there. So I'm cutting the stroke. I say it loud. If the stroke is tumorous, I cut it. There's no point. It is not even functioning to start with. But it harbors a tumor. So you work before the chiasm and after the chiasm, and then you manipulate the tumor out. But just putting this case for you to show you that you can do radical excision, even in recurrent tumors. Here, you are seeing the reliquist membrane, the blue thing deep inside is the reliquist membrane. And what you see inside is the basilar artery with its bifurcation. So here you are, the medullary artery, with the superior cerebral artery and posterior cerebral artery. 
If the stock is not involved, I keep it. Okay. Now we'll put the 3D, so we'll be watching that screen. Just to show you the difference between 2D and 3D in terms of education and in terms of details. So I have to put the glasses, the goggles, like the old pilots of the Second World War. You have to see depth. If you don't see depth, then your goggles are not correct. Is this a new technology? No, it's about 10 years old. But we are the only ones using it because we care about teaching, about transmitting the information to junior people. How many? How many? I will come to the slide to, to, to speak about the occurrences and the complications. Because if I stand here and say I did not have complication, I would be a liar. Any surgeon says that he did not have a complication is a liar, but he has not done the case. So he did not have complications. So are we set? Everybody is happy with his Googles so that we can fly together into the depth of the ocean. A neurosurgery is to operate underwater in the cavities and caves under the ocean. Please. Uh, We should have had two uh, screens for 3D, but unfortunately, we were promised to have a second one. We did not get it. Hopefully, we will. We'll have three because we need uh, for a big audience. But for tonight, it's enough to. That's if it works. Are you in 3D? You have the depth. So we're working here inside the cell between the two optic nerves. I'm holding the tumor in my forceps and trying to dissect it. Imagine that this surgery is done without microscope by, by mediocre surgeons. Imagine. Here, you can use the ultrasonic aspirator. Some people are afraid to use it. Why? You are in control. So you can point it to what you want. But if you put it on the optic, it will take it out, it will suck it. So you put it where you want. If you can use it, especially with the calcifications. Here we are removing the tumor from the optic chiasm, and immediately the blue thing that appears in the depth is the basilar artery with its termination. Here we are removing the tumor. Piece by piece, never in piece, never in one piece. Piece See basilar, the blue thing there with its final termination. Here I'm finding a attachment to the stock. Stock is here. This is the stock here, and the tumor is attached to it. But the, the stock is not uh, infiltrated by the tumor. So I keep it. Here we are. I'm trying to remove the tumor. Off the stove, the stove is pushed. It is pushed to the side. This is the chance of the patient. If you don't give him that chance, hell, don't don't even think of doing surgery. Mm -hmm. Yes. So here we are. We're moving the last piece of the tumor attached to the stove. The stove is still functioning. When I finish, Dr. Chama, I preserve the stove. Or, oh, Dr. Juma, the stoke was infiltrated by the tumor, so I totally 
I cut it because it's a tulip. Look at this leaf. Beautiful leaf. Only skull based surgery. Only craniofaryngioma surgeons can give you this leaf. If you are not, don't try it. Don't do Umayya Reservoir. Don't put a shot. Don't do these crimes. It's beautiful view. Okay, second one. Last one. وكل الدكتور مفرسح لأنه تأخر شوي. Another recurrent cranial hemorrhage. So not only for the primary hemorrhage that was never been operated upon, also the recurrent ones. You can achieve radical total excision. And I'm here using the ultrasonic aspirator, just nearby the optic cage. I'm not afraid to use that. It is calcified. It is the only way to excise the tumor. Tell me, if you leave this tumor, how would the patient survive? How would the patient benefit from radiotherapy or whatever? It's a huge tumor, recurrent. Take it out. You start seeing the basilar arch you now. Calcified tumor. But you can't find the primary cleavage. But if you are a bad surgeon, you don't want to look for it. You just tell it and say, I'm a wise surgeon, I'm stuff here. I don't want to damage the patient. You don't know. I made it my job in life to expose the mediocre surgeons and to expose the mediocre surgery that is done in our country against our people. It is my duty in life, and I will not stop until I die. It is my duty, religious duty, humanity duty, that we should point to the wrong things and say, this is wrong, stop it. Even if 99% are doing it, they must stop it. Almost, almost 99. <laughs> so you go for the last piece of the tumor. This surgery can take 12 hours, 15 hours, I don't mind. I don't want it to be 12 hours, but it can't take that much until you reach there and you dissect and so on and so forth. We'd love to do the surgery as quick as possible, but not as funny as possible or as mediocre as possible. So piece by piece, you take the tumor out, piece after piece after piece. And some of the residents would say, doctor, this is endless tumor, it does not want to end. Truly, it is endless. You remove piece after piece and still come with you. Can, can you put it from surgery which one that you can do? No, never. No. So this is the end of it. You can see the optic hairs and the nerves. The olfactory tract is preserved. Again, the mediocre surgeons would cut the olfactory because olfaction is not important for them. They will cut accessory nerve, it's not important. They will cut the brachial plexus, it is not important. They will chop half of the cerebellum, because it is more than each half of the cerebellum, and so on. And they convince resident, residents that this is the right thing to do. This is not the right thing to do at all. So we'll stop here, because we are coming late in time. But this is how it looks at the end of the day. So, I've done 102. I had two mortalities. I'll share one with you. This was done at Santa Square, meaning another hospital. Uh, wrong perinatal inside. Tumor is still the same. What is the solution but to go again and do the surgery? We did surgery, beautiful surgery, but for one reason or another, slow deterioration and he died on the seventh hospital. Not because of the eye, just a slow deterioration for no good reason. Morbidity, complications. Let me remind you of this paper, famous paper by Falbush, that post-operative endocrine improvement is exceptional. You don't never say that my patients improved in pituitary uh, function because they never do. Most of them, they would need some support. Some of my complications, subdural hygroma, hydrocephalus, CSR1 leak, meningitis, etc., and some temporary endocrine worsening, some temporary obesity, and so on and so forth. Recurrence, this is what we are asking ourselves. Of the 84, what I did radical, 
Mind you, this is the whole number. I've done radical in this. I went in with the intention of radical, but I just couldn't with all my experience. So I have to accept defeat, but not to go in with the mind that I'm going to do perhaps I'm going to decompress this level and so on. This nonsense that they are using. With the subtotal resection, the recurrence is happening. And because it is going into the world of the characters. So you pull it, you have a baby. You have a catastrophe. Uh, one of the cases of recurrence, this uh, beautiful girl with this tumor, we did total <laughs> radical excision. So even if you do a total radical, there's still a chance of recurrence. What about if you do biopsy? It's 100% recurrence. So she went out and came back with this huge recurrence. Treatment? Am I reservoir? Shunt? No. Let the conversation go. There she is. Grown into a beautiful young woman. What about obesity? A few slides and we'll finish. Obviously, it could be before surgery, it could be after surgery. And I have not noticed obesity in old patients. These old patients of mine did not have any obesity. Old adults did not have any obesity. But with kids, yes. With radical excision, you can rest assured you will have obesity. Is that fearsome? No, I'm not worried. It will disappear in one year's time. So look at her coming back to her normal without any treatment, just by telling them when to eat and how to eat. Look at this beautiful girl going some obesity and then going to be beautiful girl. Again. All these children, they develop obesity and then it disappeared. And uh, this is an observation of mine that nobody has reported so far. I'm the only one who's reporting this. This is a patient from Sudan, gaining weight on the back to his normal. And this beautiful girl also did not even gain, except for a slight weight. Last but not least, this is the last slide. I operated on this boy back in 2001. This is his post operative on my eye. Immediate was of the following day. 2003, 2005, no recurrence. Of course, no radiation, no shunt. 2012, 13, 14, 16. Look at him. I think the, the satisfaction of seeing this boy growing without the misery of radiation, without the misery of a shunt or a reservoir is most security for me. Not uh, a sum of money of any kind can give me the satisfaction that I had from this boy. So this is as he was young, and this as 20 years later. Fully active, he's gonna get married. He's a second year student in the college. And this is his yesterday photos. Thank you very much. <laughs> any questions or comments? Thank you. I just comment. And you stressed in your lecture and every lecture about your total excision, complete excision training in Jerusalem, and about my practice in society. I think new surgeons who are doing just privacy or just Looking at some of the reservoir or anything. He is doing that because he hasn't discovered, he doesn't have enough skills and proper training to do that. And at the same time, he doesn't want to be And we don't have the culture of this, I will refer to that, but it's better. We don't have a And I think until we have uh, you know, some sort of anonymous hazard, uh, if a are not the right one, we have a different motion, rather than the center, who are not the right one, but Mr. Samir said, I really feel it in medicine. Even in medicine, you yeah, have to have a large amount of sugar, and you have to have a lot of sugar. I think I do have a lot of this, I 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 have a lot
in random circuitry experiments in control by the Dosti. Very وهذا بنطبق على orthopedic surgery, thyroid surgery, فهذا إذا ما صار قانون محاسب ما عنده أي شيء، بعدين قالوا نعمل orthopedic surgery. Any questions or comments, please? And so also the mini Germans. Yeah. And so also the, the second thing is this initiated and that's the process which takes kind of like And uh, it's very important to be that I and I think that the first year is the role of the girls. Because the uh, element time is the clear uh, way. And we have to look for the differentiation between two parts. We have to look for the team of the which the higher effects is an identified 60% and second one of the CT scan, so we call the citation, so the citation is outside, sometimes 100% in the identified in the area of the category. The third thing is the spectroscopy. Nowadays, we are using spectroscopy to differentiate between two parts because the identified part gives a wide the thing about clinical enjoyment are difficult is an old teaching and it has just kept in the minds of mediocre surgeons. Still in their residence, clinical enjoyment cannot be removed. Wrong. It can be removed. All the tumors in that area are attached to the current and the optic nerve. It is your duty to remove it. Any question or comment? Very My question is about the follow-up process. How often do you follow them for follow-up? All patients of brain tumors, whatever that is, I keep monitoring them every three months for one year, every six months for two years, and every year thereafter. Forever. Forever. If no questions or comments, thank you very much. We'll meet next Wednesday. Hi, Dr. Sabea, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can, thank you. A, a, a new oratorium, huh? Yes. <laughs> oh, very I'm good, here. very good. Let me briefly introduce the neurosurgeons that are here with me now, so that you see that you are reaching people outside that oratorium. Uh, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Dr. Khalid, I'm watching you from Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, Thank you for the very interesting uh, uh, presentation. As you said, the, what, what we've seen about this disease is that it's, it's, it's recurrence rate, especially when you don't take out the capsule. And the fear that most surgeons have of pan pituitary hypo, pan hypopituitarism after the surgery. So those are the biggest two issues that, that we are facing and that it's very common with this disease. It is unsatisfied fear. It is yeah. bad teaching. It yes. is a uh, uh, legacy of the past. Clinical yes. enjoyments are difficult to remove. If you remove them, they will go into mean, hormonal, and endocrine, and hypothalamic. Forgetting yeah. that if you leave a tumor there, the tumor will yeah. do the job for you. It will cause the patient to be worse, and then you give radiotherapy, yeah. and the current functions will go. So it is a legacy of the past. The treatments of clinical enjoyments has to improvise, and we have to go ahead with the recent development. With the surgery, with the radical surgery. So, surgery. what is what is an acceptable acceptable morbidity, according to to? And as you see, in my series, I had two morbid mortalities in 102 patients, which is the universal yeah. accepted range. And the same thing with morbidity. As I always say, that if a neurosurgeon say that I did not have complications or mortality, yeah. he's lying. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Gabulo, do you want to say hi to your friend? Yes. Uh, good evening, father Hello. and mentor. Hello, how are you? I'm fine, father. It's you. 
Thank you so much for the great yes, thank you so much for the great presentation. I'm really impressed about your series. That was great. I'm I'm really impressed. So my small question was uh you didn't mention much about visual disturbances. Yes. What do you think, like, what is the, reco the, the recovery of visual when patient present with complete blindness before surgery? You get patient who recovered visual? Sure. Uh, first of all, I have to mention that Dr. Carolo is a friend of mine and he's recognized worldwide as a skeletal surgeon. So thank you for joining us. That's what the ritual manifestations. Most of the time, about 50% of the patients come with visual manifestations. If you catch them early, they will improve. If you catch them late, they will not improve. So the better to go as early as possible or as radical as possible. Very good. Okay. okay. Uh, I'd like to introduce Anas to Dr. Sabea. Hello, Anas. Could you please introduce yourself? Good evening. Good evening. I, I can't hear you, Anas. Can we can't hear you, you Anas. Um, uh, thank you very much for the uh, I'm sorry, Anas. I don't think we can hear you. I don't think Dr. Sabe can hear you. Okay, well, we'll have to save that question, okay? Yes, I can send it to me on the end. Oh, can you hear him okay? Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, I want to ask uh, 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 refer the biofrontal of the craniofaryngeal. This is a approach because we uh, preserve the anterior one third of the su superior sagittal sinus. Hearing you correctly, you are asking about the interhemispheric approach. And what I do with the interhemispheric approach is that I cut the superior sagittal sinus at its most anterior part. And I make a point that I should not damage one vein in my way. Sometimes you have to sacrifice one vein, but that's it about it. And once you do that, you cut the superior sagittal sinus at its very anterior most part, and then you can retract and then go interhemispheric. You can find the anterior uh, communicating artery and mobilize it, the arachnoid, and see the optic nerve chiasm. You can see the perforators of the anterior communicating and proceed from there. Anas, by the way, is from Germany. Uh, okay, Dr. Sabe, I'd like to thank you very much. What is the topic next week? I have not decided yet, but we will find something very interesting, I'm sure. Okay, very good. Congratulations on the new auditorium. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. See okay. you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.